such outrage in the physics community. To most classically trained physicists, the concept of low-level nuclear reactions producing significant heat energy was inconceivable. The nuclei of atoms are all positively charged and naturally repel one another. They don't want to come together, to fuse, except at millions of degrees. And when they do, deadly radiation is released. When Fleischmann and Pons claimed that they had created nuclear reactions at room temperature, university and government laboratories around the world immediately set out to replicate the experiment, which, superficially, looked simple. Some reported similar anomalous heat and nuclear byproducts, such as tritium, low-level neutrons, and helium. Others at major universities, such as MIT and Caltech, claimed they had found nothing. The idea that two chemists could be doing this on a tabletop um, really sounded uh, very, almost Alice in Wonderlandish, I must say. So uh, I think our reaction was not unlike that of other physicists who, who thought, uh, on the one hand, gee, that'd be marvelous if they're doing it, and then on the other hand, my God, chemists doing it for probably pennies compared to what physicists have uh, they have uh, taken from the public coffer over the last 40 years in the order of $40 billion to do hot fusion. So the nuclear physics community said, well, you know, the nuclear physics of this is looking very strange. It doesn't seem to be right. Where are the neutrons? Where are the gamma rays? And eventually, I think because of this uh, nuclear, bad nuclear physics, and because of the fact that people were having difficulty reproducing this, the physicists threw out the uh, uh, good baby, which was the excess heat effect, uh, along with the bad uh, nuclear interpretation bathwater. That was very unfortunate. At SRI International in Menlo Park, California, Dr. Michael McCubrey was one of the first scientists to replicate the cold fusion effect. Fortuitous or not, uh, in the first experiment that we uh, ran some three or four months after the initial announcement, we saw some evidence of excess uh, heat, uh, which has really sustained me uh, ever since. Having seen the effect with my own eyes, the claims from a few that this is impossible, um, inconsistent with all known laws of uh, nuclear physics, uh, these, these uh, suggestions are, in fact, irrelevant. There is no theoretical objection to cold fusion. It's just unlikely, given our experience with uh, hot fusion. At Texas A&M, a group led by Professor John Bockrath, who was widely regarded as one of the world's greatest electrochemists, reported finding the hydrogen isotope tritium, a key signature that some unusual nuclear reaction was going on. The, the first thing was this, uh, this, this uh, thing called tritium, which was a, uh, a, s a sub-form of hydrogen which should not exist uh, except in extremely tiny quantities. We found that by working these uh, cells of Fleischmann and Pons that contain lithium hydroxide and deuterium oxide, that we could produce this tritium in great abundance let's say, at uh, 10,000 times more than it ought to be there, as it were. And um, let, me, let me stress that we couldn't do it every time, but about one result in five, or one result in four, and eventually we worked up to two results out of three, um, we could produce tritium. That was the first thing, and, and in a way it was the first clear proof of the phenomenon. Halfway around the world, at the Bhava Atomic Research Center in India, Dr. Mahadeva Srinivasan provided confirmation. Within a few weeks, within two or three weeks, we got the first results. And several groups started saying, yes, we are seeing excess heat. And, uh, but the most important and unbelievable phenomenon at that time was the observation of tritium. Back at Texas A&M, Bacchus's group found themselves under attack. Science magazine writer Gary Tobbs wrote a stinging article that insinuated that someone in the group had spiked the samples with tritium. Although unfounded and eventually proved untrue, 
The allegation effectively dampened Bacchus's remarkable claims. Well, I was 69 years old at that time. And I took the attitude. Suppose they fire me, right? It doesn't really matter. I had my career. The worst they could do would be to say, go, your tenure is withdrawn. And uh, therefore I wasn't frightened. And I went on saying the truth and publishing what we'd got. And, but finally the university uh, revolted against this. And, uh, they set up an inquiry, uh, as they called it, rather sinisterly. The accusation was that I had carried out misconduct of research, you see, that I shouldn't have worked on these things. And they decided that the accusations were totally groundless and they published all this. But then they started all again about six months later and they had another committee. It was this time uh, when my lawyers asked the university what the second inquiry was about. They were told, it's an ad hoc committee. What's that? Um, we have nothing further to tell you. And so this went on for 11 months of uh, constant meetings and inquiries and so on. And I'm quite sure that uh, they were trying to find an excuse to end my tenure, you see. Getting tenure in most traditional uh, science departments depends on doing mainstream research. Being a leader in mainstream research, but doing mainstream research, and not doing fringe area research, investigating things like cold fusion, uh, once you're tenured, uh, it's a bit of a different story in that, uh, in principle, you can investigate any field you like, and people have done that. But even then, uh, the way things are connected uh, with money, uh, power in universities today, uh, your life can be made rather difficult if you are identified with those areas. Finally, they came out uh, okay. I mean, they gave me another letter. I'd had the letter of complete exoneration. This time it said that they had uh, spent this 11 months and had found that I had never done anything, the phrase used were, uh, that contravened the rules of procedure of this university or something rather formal and stuffy like that. Normally we'd say if someone's uh, innocent until proven guilty and you'd be given the opportunity to have a trial rather than having an article written about what you've done wrong <laughs> and identifies being guilty in the, in the press rather than uh, uh, due process. Anyway, all these things were happening and uh, it uh, just makes one sad. But I think the main part was that I had done work which was against the paradigm and that was what they were really upset about. You know, people said that they'd been to other universities and people had laughed at it and said, what the heck are you doing trying to disprove the laws of nuclear physics? And of course, that's exactly what we were doing <laughs> and succeeding, you see. Cold fusion scientists long ago put the issue of measurement accuracy to rest. Like good scientists, they tried to prove themselves wrong. Still, the excess heat findings persist. Since 1848, it has been known that a certain amount of heat is required to change the temperature of a given amount of water. At premier labs such as SRI International, Dr. Michael McCubrey has determined that the effect is neither fleeting nor difficult to measure. The cold fusion cell is enclosed in a calorimeter which has thermocouples at various key points to read the temperatures. The experiment looks extremely complex on the surface, but fundamentally, it is simple. An ordinary coffee maker provides an analogy. Cold water goes in, hot water comes out. The temperature of the water is read before the electrical input is supplied, and then again as it rises. Some of the heat is lost during the process, but the result is obvious. Lukubri's calorimeter works in a similar way, but with an accuracy of one one-thousandth of a degree. The cooling water flows in a steady stream and passes the inlet thermocouple, which measures the temperature. It swirls around the cell, cooling it down and carrying off the heat. When it exits, the outlets...